On this episode of the Tough Juice Podcast, I had a good friend of mine, WNBA champion, Natasha Cloud on, and she talked about many things, being one of the first WNBA players to pivot away from the game, to focus on social inequity and injustices that's happening around the world. She also talked about the importance of having a brand like Converse behind her. I don't want to give it all away yet. She also talked about Della Don and some of the news that came down uh, with her and her conditions, her underlying health conditions, and why she was just taken back when she saw some of the news and the position that the WNBA has taken, you know, going forward with her returning back to play. So many more, her overseas experiences and what she's actively trying to do as a frontline marcher and being in, all in, for social injustices happening in the world. Subscribe to the Tough Juice podcast on the Himalaya app or wherever you listen to your pods. We we all are, but why you why are you upset right now? Uh, I'm fuming because that's family to me. And I've seen, I've played with Della for three years now. Um, I've seen her have to push her body through a season. I've seen her take IVs like it's Gatorade during our season just to finish the season because of what Lyme disease actually does to her body and to her immune system. I've been speaking with Della all off season. She doesn't leave her home. Even with groceries, she does not leave her home because COVID has the potential to be a life-threatening issue for her. And while it is for other Americans as well, but to deny her when you have over 50 pages of documentation from her physician that has been with her for the entire uh, duration of her Lyme disease uh, battle to go against that advice from her physician that says that it is a a deadly threat to her and her body. I don't understand it. I don't understand how you can uh, not only deny someone that is a non-essential worker, someone that this can directly affect in one of the most negative ways, but then you're also denying the face of your league, one of the many faces of your league, a reigning MVP, the, the reigning champ, someone that's a part of the only woman that's a part of 50-40-90 club. Like, she's not just skipping to skip. This is literally a threat to her life, is going into a bubble. And, and so I'm, I'm fuming. And I'm extremely upset with the WNBA because they continue to push this agenda that their players don't matter. It's about business. Well, you know, I'm glad you said that. Um push that agenda and I love the fact that all the star players not just you know players in general but star players like yourself like Renee Montgomery Sue Bird so many others that are stick like really stepping up in a major way and drawing the line in the sand and speaking up and speaking Mm -hmm. out speaking loud you know even when you know the Atlanta uh, dream owner had came out and said some things or you know or didn't say some things uh, people spoke out on that and this situation as well. How important or why is it important for, you know, so many people to speak up, you know, for Della Don and, and, and about all these issues that, that you see happening in real time? Because regardless of race, because we're a league made up of 144 women, we're each other's sisters. And yes, once we cross those lines, we're going to compete. We're going to draw blood. We're going to do all that. We're all trying to win a championship for our respective teams. But off the court, we're looking now for one another. This is a sisterhood that, uh, you know, 144 of us are a part of. And so in any facet, even if this wasn't Della, say it was another player from a different team, I'm going to speak up the same as I am now. Do I feel a little bit more attached? Absolutely, because Della's family to me. But uh, this is a sisterhood. I support every single woman that's in that bubble right now and every single one that's not. Um, and I think that's the beautiful thing about the W. I don't know if you always get that in professional sports uh, across the board, but 
in our league, you for sure do. Man, this is something that, you know, we've all been like pretty much battling something ever since, I would have to say, you know, the beginning of the year, you know, you talk about the, the, the death of David Stern. You talk about the, the passing of, you know, our brother and, you know, my mentor and a close friend, Kobe Bryant. You talk about COVID being, you know, thrown out there and inserted in our life where, you know, our normal was changed forever. When you talk about the death of George Floyd and seeing all the social injustice and everything that has been happening, how have you been able to just like cope with all this shit that's happening like in real time? Ooh, it's 2020 has been a bitch to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Like it, that's just what it is. Um, there's been so many situations that have been tragic uh, to our lives um, as you just spoke upon, um, but you have to keep pushing forward. And I think that's something that's not only embedded in us as athletes, but it's also embedded in us as Black Americans too. It doesn't matter what obstacles come in your way. You just got to continue to push forward and figure out, okay, this happened. How do I adapt? How do I continue to push forward? Uh, not only for myself, but those that um, are surrounding me uh, as well. And so uh, it's, it's something that, again, it's just embedded us to keep pushing forward and understanding that um, for me it, it personally, understanding that things like this have happened and it's been tragic and it's been terrible, but I don't want these deaths to be lost and left in vain. I want, I want something beautiful to come out of this. So I'm going to continue to fight in whatever way, whatever facet I need to fight in order to make sure that these deaths aren't forgotten, um, but they continue to live on through us moving forward. And, and that brings me to my next question, and I'm glad you said that because of perfect segue. Um, you elected to not play this season, mm -hmm. and, and you touched on some of those things when we were talking about Della Don, and you guys was the reigning champs. Congratulations on that again. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. you know, and it, it it it's like one of those things where you're in the prime and in the height of your career, and then you see the things visually that's happened, all these injustices, and then you're like, you know what? Was it just one of those things like I can do more, not focusing on this and pivoting in this space, and I need to be out here physically? Absolutely. When, when you talk about going into a season, people don't understand what we, what we do. They think that, oh, they just go play basketball and make money for it. No, you, you don't understand the hours, the time, the blood, sweat, and tears, the preparation, the film study, the, the going over scout, making sure you're completely com prepared to win a championship. People don't see that side of things. They just see, oh, they're playing Saturday night and that's you know, 40 minutes on the floor. I can't be a champion in the WNBA 100% while also being a champion for our community while being in a bubble. If this was a normal season, I'd be able to do both as I have been in, in years prior too. But this is, this is different. And George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, their deaths shook America and they woke it up. And a lot of people are pissed that it took that to wake them up. but at the same time, too, we need to harness this momentum, this leverage, and move forward. And for me personally, I can't do that from a bubble to the best of my ability. Um, there's something about, as role models, as athletes, as if you even want to put us in the realm of celebrity, because I won't, but we're held to on a pedestal. And so when you take yourself off that pedestal, you take that jersey off, and you put yourself on the community and you say, put yourself in the community and you say, I'm here for y'all. Now I'm marching with y'all. I'm going to stand right here beside y'all and we're going to do this together. There's nothing more impactful than your presence. And so that was extremely important for me with choosing to sit out. I want to be on the front lines. I want to be present. I want to be part of the solution. And to do so, I need to be present. And I'm so glad you said that. And I'm so glad that you're actively doing that. Uh, I, this, this was my suggestion and, you know, 40 year old me, I would not go to the bubble. Um, but I, I understand why a lot of guys are still electing to go to the, Absolutely. the bubble because of revenue and things like that. But 
it is a massive platform as long as the message and the messaging coming out of the bubble is, you know, focus on social injustice. Like, what's, what was your thought with some of the people that you know, some of your peers, you know, still participating? Did you judge them or look at them differently because they went inside? Absolutely not. Everyone's situation is different. Everyone's story is different. So for the women that went into the bubble, I support y'all 100%. And I'm going to hold you down from out here in whatever facet that I can. And a lot of people think that, oh, well, Tosh that out so she doesn't support the sister's claim. No, I do. I can't wait for games to start up. I can't wait for to cheer on my teammates and, and, and push them to win another championship. I'm so excited for that. But at the same time, too, that's not my calling for this season. And, and that's okay. Um, I'm also proud of, yes, we're putting names on the back of our jerseys. We're putting Black Lives Matters on the court for both leagues. That's super important. While, while I have said it's important to keep that message, that visibility on Black Lives Matters, on the victims of police brutality. But also there needs to be something more than that because we've done that in the past. We've wore t-shirts while warming up. We've done media blackouts. We have, uh, you know, we've never put anything on the court, but there has to be actual things that we do within those bubbles of both the men and the women that push for change. And, and so that's where I'm really excited to see. I know for the women's side, uh, we have a, like a council, a, a, a social council um, that will lead and direct with, from within the bubble. So I'm excited to see what they come up with. Um, but I, I will say that, yes, names are great. The court is great, but that's not enough. That's exactly how I felt, too. I think that, you know, it's pretty dope to have, like, symbolic trophies, you know, where mm. it's something visually, and, but it has to be, like, a real call to action. Yes. You know? And uh, what has, you know, from all the information that you've been receiving and talking to different organizations, what is the call to action that you would like to see? There's so many. When you look at systemic racism, oppression, police brutality, wage gap, gender equity. I mean, this is like an intimidating beast that we have to now face and try uh, to slay in the sense where um, the first call of action though that I feel is so important and it's a low hanging fruit that we can have immediate impact on is our voting. We have a huge election coming up. And, and when I say it's a huge election, it is um, because we need someone fit to run our country. and. I know a lot of people don't like the candidates at hand, but at this point in this moment in time, our ancestors fought for this right, this right to vote. They died for this right. And so now it is on us to take a personal responsibility of creating change and taking our voice back. Um, and that starts with our vote and not only from the federal levels, but more so importantly at the local and state levels as well. Who is representing us? Do they have the best interest of our communities in sight? Is that what they're fighting for? Um, so voting is huge, educating our community, making sure that we're registered uh, to vote because it would surprise you how many people are not even registered to vote, uh, making sure that there's tra transportation to the voting, uh, the voting polls. I think Atlanta did a really good job in making their arena open for it that now takes away from voter suppression that happens way too far often in our community. Um, so there's, there's little things that are here that we can grab the low hanging fruits and, and voting is one of them. I'm so glad you said that because when you talk about voter suppression and uh, you know, I know that here, you know, Wisconsin was trending a few times for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And one of them was extremely bad. When you look at the demographic of a, like a four mile radius, they had three locations open in the midst of COVID, and we're supposed to be practicing social distancing. Mm -hmm. well, on the outskirts of Wisconsin and all the neighboring counties and you know cities, they had everything spaced out, uh, so convenient, uh, easy to get through. Um, and we saw that the black and brown community, Latinx community was getting extremely discouraged sitting in its lines. And you know mm -hmm. what, it felt like they vote really didn't matter anyway. And to anybody that's listening and viewing, and checking us out, 
uh, on this podcast. I want you to know that your vote do matter, you know, and, and, and something that you touched on, Queen, was, you know, think about the sit-ins, think about the marches, just mm-hmm. for us to have civil rights. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it's so important that we have to, we have to stay out there and get bit by the bugs and all that shit. <laughs> you know, stay out there. If you got to mask up, if you got to put your foil on or whatever you got to do in the midst of COVID, man, you know, make sure that you vote because I feel, and I'm 40 years old, this is the most important uh, election of our lifetime. Top to bottom. Absolutely. 100% agree. Yeah. Yes. You know, are you actively working with any organizations to, you know, move the needle on the votes? Well, it's funny because I'm in, so I not only have my mystics and wizards family that we have teamed up and, and presented a unified front. We're working on it together as well as I'm working with Converse and Red Bull as well on the other side of the spectrum. Um, I think we're going with Rock the Boat. Uh, I will let you know because we're finalizing it here in the next week or so. Uh, But Rock the Boat is huge. It's been here. It's been present. It's been a leader um, in a lot of different ways. Um, So being able to utilize them and use their resources uh, to amplify our voices is is the goal here with moving forward and making sure that uh, we're doing our job of, of making it easier, more accessible, and educating our community as well. Do, and don't do vote it. for Kanye. I got to say this. Oh, my gosh. You're just putting that out there. Do not vote for that man. A vote for Kanye is a vote for that strange man that's been in our White House for four years now. Do not be fooled. Do not. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I'm tripping because a lot of people just follow waves and trends. And yes. I, I think now is it's more important than ever to like, nobody's really surfaced with like a real black and brown Latinx community agenda. Like no mm-hmm. one's came and presented something that I'm just like, whoa, like that's, that's dope. Like, I don't know if it's from an education standpoint is, is from like addressing the, 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 like you said, the wealth gap, or if it's addressing over 45 million people that's unemployed and sitting mm-hmm. furloughs, like, we need to address this because it's wiping out middle class and this just making the economy rich and poor. What's your thoughts on that? I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and that's something that people don't realize is exactly what you just said. Pretty soon with, with how we're headed, the climate of our country, there's going to be the elite and the poor. There's going to be no middle room. And so when you, when you look at America and, and how we've been set up, how our system works. This is not what it was intended to be. You know, it was intended to keep the white status quo. There needs to be a closing of that gap because there's enough wealth to go around for everyone. And I know I sound like kumbaya, but like, I mean that shit. I I really do mean that there is enough, enough wealth to go around to be able to take care of every single piece of, of, our system and so I, I agree when I say that the middle middle class gets forgotten about a lot. Our community uh, of, of black and brown gets forgotten about a lot. We're told what we want to hear, but that's not followed up by action. So um, we need to also demand more. One hundred percent. What what has the conversations been like? you know, to, you know, with with your peers, like when you elected to do the brave act and say, you know what, I'm not playing this season, you know, uh, social justice and reform is very important. I know that I have to be involved more physically and have my presence. Did like when people reached out to you, like what was those conversations like? I was surprised um, because it was all love. And I, I say that because I'm one of 144. Uh, I'm coming off the championship season. I'm coming off one of my best seasons personally. I'm coming off signing a deal with Converse and being like, okay, y'all, I'm sitting out the 2020 season for this reason. Um, but the love and the support that I've gotten, that I've had um, throughout this decision has been such a beautiful thing. Um, it's been a, a needed thing too to see that there's still a lot of good in people 
that they understand why I'm making this sacrifice and that they fully support me moving forward. And, um, so I'm extremely thankful knowing that I have good people surrounding me. But look, you mentioned the brand Converse and the way that they stepped up in a major way and still supporting you financially, mm -hmm. you know, in the midst of all this. Like, how major is that? Because we see so many institutions that's trying to insert themselves now. Mm -hmm. uh, Hindsight, but Converse been there for the beginning through all these social movements and everything. How important is having a brand behind you, backing you like they are? Man, it, it's everything. Because um, like I just said, with, with making the decision to sit out this season, I'm also technically breaking my contract for Converse. And so I was really nervous, uh, you know, when discussing it with them because we've seen it in the past in all sports professional levels that you either lose endorsements, sponsorships, you can be fired if you're in the NFL specifically for speaking up and standing up for what you believe in. Um, and, you know, when I told them that it's much big, bigger than basketball to me, they were in 100% support. Like, I didn't even have to finish my sentence. Um, you know, their thing was, uh, I learned probably like three weeks after I decided to sit out that hey, we're going to cover your contract. And I, I cried real thug tears because yeah. like you said, that, that's huge. That doesn't happen with all these other female athletes sitting out, with all these other male athletes sitting out. Have you seen their sponsors mm -hmm. try to pay their contract? No. And so for me, it, it really sunk in that, you know, they weren't just talking the talk. They're, they're walking it too. Like they said, this is about a family environment, a family atmosphere. You're our first female. We want to do right by you. We want to support you in every facet. When I signed with them, they knew that I was not only an athlete, but an activist as well. And, and um, to be supported fully is everything. Um, it gives me a lot of confidence and um, a lot of love moving forward. And they give me every resource that I need. I can call Converse right now and be like, hey, me and Karan, we want to we wanna hit this voting thing head on. He wants to join in. They'll be like, cool, what y'all need from us? That's, That's huge. That's everything. And you know what? I was thinking about like all like the history of the game. And and I want to get your take on this. When you think about all the people that came through and saw like uh, injustices in real time, how many times or how common is it for people to be like, you know what? I want to speak on that but I don't want to lose this. I don't want to lose that. And uh, have you experienced that firsthand, like with some athletes that's like big name individuals mm -hmm. that just like, I just don't want to touch that because I can lose a, I can lose a lot. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Not only from our side of, of the game, also the men's side, also looking at different sports around um, the professional level. This is a real thing that athletes feel that they can't speak up because of repercussions from their sponsorships, their endorsements. And listen, like, I'm not, I'm, I probably wouldn't have judged before because at the end of the day, this is how people provide for their families. And I can't ever knock someone for providing for their family, ever. But where we are here in 2020 on this day, if you are not speaking up, if you are being neutral, if you are scared of losing endorsements and sponsorships or speaking up about what's right, I have an issue. Because at some point, being a human has to matter more than money. Yeah. Because for far too long, money continues to drive everything, everything in our country. And, and for me, it's at what point do we say we need to restore humanity? And we need to restore our hearts and, and our morals and our values because they've been just thrown out the window. Um, so I think, I think that's huge uh, with moving forward is just athletes using the platforms and being a voice for the voiceless. You didn't sign up to be a role model. You didn't sign up for, to be an activist, but it falls under your responsibility with where we are here in America. I'm, I'm glad that you touched on this, is, this isn't the time to be politically correct. No. And I think that you have to see, uh, you got to have empathy in this moment and you have to be honest and you have to just identify the truth and stand on it. And, you know, 
what's your thoughts on, you know, going forward? Like, what would you like to see? Because you know, a, a lot more people are using their platform. They're, they're doing the blackouts. They're posting the marches and all that. But I think that we lack uh, a lot of folks being informed. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'll give you an example. Like, I see like three, four generations out there marching. And, but when you talk to them uh, specifically on why you're out here, they say, oh, somebody got killed and it was bogus. And I just, I didn't like what I saw, but I want them to understand that it's been hundreds of mm-hmm. years of oppression yes. and understand that dynamic. So now you can have real solutions going forward. So mm-hmm. what, what would you advise like people that's like first just getting off into this right now and trying to inform and educate themselves. What would you say to them? Google is free. <laughs> <laughs> Google is free. It got me through college. It got me through high school, all, all that. But no, like I say that and I'm a smart ass when I say it, but I, I truly mean it. Google is free. You can find what actually happened in American history online because our books in schools aren't going to tell us the true history of America. They fabricate it. They fabricate it to to be this American dream. But that American dream only was intended for people that weren't brown and black. So if you want to know why people keep bringing up slavery and 400 years of oppression, then research it and understand why this trauma is still present here in 2020. We didn't have to be alive with our ancestors to feel the trauma. And for that to continue on through our lives, we didn't have to be alive back then to, to be here in this moment. But we also need to understand is, is while this was 400 plus years ago, we haven't changed that much. And I don't think people understand that either because they don't know the history. And so moving forward in order to progress, we need to understand what happened, what we tried, what didn't work what can potentially work um, and, and where, what direction we need to head in. And, and also another thing that I wanted to touch on was I hate how this is being made into a Republican and Democratic dispute. It, that is not what this, we are talking about Black Lives Matter. We are talking about minorities in this country matter. It has nothing to do with being a Republican or a Democrat because being honest, both our candidates suck. Yeah. But I'm willing to take the lesser of evil because for far too long, people have, with the Trump thing, I don't think all Trump supporters are racist. I do not. But what you say to me by supporting that man is that racism wasn't the breaking point for you. Racism is okay. That division is okay for you. That's not okay for me. And so I don't want it to be a Republican Democrat thing. This needs to be a human and Black Lives Matter thing moving forward. Um, and if you have a problem with equity and equality, then you're part of the problem. I think, I think folks still don't get that message right there that you just touched on. And you, and you, you summed it up so well. And when you say just as simple as that, Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. You, it, like no one's saying that Black Lives are better. No one's saying no. that the worse. Of, we're just saying that they matter, and and it, it it got a lot of people like upset and in an uproar because when you talk about you know all the things uh, from you know discrimination and you know old Jim Crow, new Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Movement, all these different things, white privilege mm-hmm. in America. And you just say, look, Black Lives Matter. We just want people to understand that we need financial inclusion. We need equality uh, to be a real thing here. And we need a leveling field, a even an even playing field. People get upset. And mm-hmm. I think that, that is definitely the problem. And if you're uncomfortable when that conversation comes up, you're the problem. Absolutely. I really feel that way. I, I truly do, because... If you're saying, if I'm talking to one of my white counterparts and what what you're saying to me is that all lives matter, that's a slap in my face because you're not understanding what I'm saying. You're not hearing me. When when we say Black Lives Matters, 
We're not saying that other lives don't matter, but that this very moment, black lives are the ones suffering. My minorities, brown ones are the ones suffering. And so until black life and brown lives matter, all lives cannot matter. Real talk. And the only reason all lives matters was even started was because we put the word black in front of lives matter. And so when, when you're moving forward and Black Lives Matters is being called a terroristic movement, that's bullshit to me. Because we can sit here and, and, and protest peacefully, ask for equality, ask for equity, ask for uh, the wage gap to be closed, ask for gender equity. We can ask for all that and it's dismissed because a Black person's asking for it. And, and that's insane to me because the KKK can march to DC every summer. And you can, you can hide behind those masks and their politicians, their police officers, their, their people that are in positions of power. But yet Black Lives Matters, we're asking for equity is, is deemed a terroristic movement and a bad movement. Why? That's, listen, that's so spot on and on point. And I'm so glad you know, when I saw the Not Fucking Around Coalition, you know, march up Stone Mountain. And, oh, you know, man, that was, it was beautiful. A, it was a beautiful thing to see. That visual was amazing. And, and they wasn't, you know, fucked with or they was not fucking around, period. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people saw like, look, this is a peaceful demonstration, but they did that to show like the unity one and then the power of if other groups, militant groups, uh, want to be aggressive towards our kings and queens. You know, it's definitely a lot of reinforcements that, that's organized out there, you know, that got our back. So that was like, that That was special to see. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's such a, it was such a beautiful thing. And then you talk about even the Black Panther Party and why that was started was to protect Black lives. And again, was deemed this radical, group this terroristic radical group why they were protecting our people from the systems that continue to abuse and oppress and and violate on so many levels so it's a beautiful thing that we we have groups like this moving forward and i hope it doesn't get to that point yeah. because I, I don't i don't want a race war in our country but I also do need to say that if it does come to, the, to that, then it's a lot of people's fault that proceeded to be silent and neutral because y'all wasn't hearing us. I totally agree. Uh, last couple questions for me. Um, I know you've been completely transparent with your experiences overseas. Ooh. I know you I know, listen, I, I know y'all get paid so differently over there. Mm -hmm. because, you know, you are valued as you should be valued here equally. Uh, but what have that experience been like over there? Oh, it's been different. So I've been to, <laughs> <laughs> that was me being nice. I've been to three different countries. Uh, I've been to Turkey, Australia, and China was the last one. Australia was by far my saving grace in the going overseas. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful country. It's really nice people. But with that being said, they treat their indigenous people like shit. And what made me uncomfortable in Australia was that because I was light skinned, because I was a light skinned American, I was above their indigenous people. And to me, that was crazy. And, and, and I hated how, um, that was a thing. Like they literally said it to me is like, oh no, people won't judge you because you're American. Like you're black American. That's different than being like indigenous to Australia. Why? Like, it's, it, that was insane to me. But uh, Turkey, I actually got hurt. I tore my hip labrum my first year overseas. And it was a shit show. They tried to hide my um, MRI from me, all of my documentation from the doctors explaining that I had a dorm hip labrum. I had to like break on their computer. I had to send a picture to my trainer back home. She was like, you gotta get home. Um, and then when telling the president 
um, domestic Tosh that I wanted to leave and come home because I have a torn hip labrum. He cornered me in his office yeah. and tried to threaten me. And I told him, I don't know how y'all work here, but I'm about to knock you the F out. Like if you don't back up off of me. Um, so that was kind of messy. I, I had to go home. I had to like cancel all ties with Turkey. Um, and then this past year when I was in China, uh, my, t- my team was great. They're very sweet, um, very welcoming to me. But our cultures are completely different. And I was miserable, like miserable, miserable. Um, and yeah, so I don't want to like dive into cultures being different because I understand that we're not going to be our, our, what we value here in America isn't always going to be the same overseas. Um, but it was by far different. I'm talking about like spitting on the floor in restaurants type of different. Damn. Yeah. So, you, you know, I, I know that the, the, the pay is uh, significantly different. From, different. Yeah, I know, I know it's <laughs> huge. So now I think that, you know, racism isn't going to be fixed in this calendar year. You know, for anybody, I'm just, spoiler alert, that's not yeah. happening. <laughs> but when you look at the foreseeable future, uh, you know, obviously we still can't travel internationally, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Forward, is that still in the air as well? Like, will you participate uh, in playing overseas this upcoming season? Yeah, it, it has to be. And um, I'm signed with the team in Italy. I have a pandemic clause in my contract, though. So if things don't get better or I don't feel safe going over, um, I can just not avoid my contract. But you're talking about money that will support my family for more than just a year. I mean, the the amount of money that we make compared to what we make here, it's insane. The support that we get overseas compared to what we get here is insane. I mean, I will literally walk out of the arena in a arena overseas and I will be followed by hundreds of fans trying to get autographs and pictures and and supporting you. Granted, while we're in DC and I think we have the best fans in DC, we don't get that type of love here. And so when you're talking about being a provider for my family and making sure that I do what I can while I can, basketball is never promised. Uh, I could wake up tomorrow and not be able to play the game at all. So making sure that I capitalize on these moments while while I'm still young, while I'm able to do so uh, without having kids yet, I want to be able to secure my bag so that I can secure my family for for years to come. And then that touches upon generational wealth as well. I want to be able to pass my wealth down onto my kids, the same as all these white families do. That's black wealth being passed down. That's important to me. Queen, you just made me smile from ear to ear. And I know you <laughs> And my last question for you would be this ultimately, when you talk about generational wealth, when you talk about first generational riches, what do you ultimately want your legacy to be? Ooh, um, I, I do want my legacy to be more than money. That's how I've always been. That's, you know, money has never been like deciding factors for me. But when you're talking about creating that revenue and that generational wealth to be passed down on to my family, and hopefully I can do it for other families as well, that's so important for for me, for you, for us as a Black community moving forward. Because if they're not going to do it, then we need to take the responsibilities within ourselves to do so. And so that means supporting each other as brothers and sisters, supporting each other in our businesses. Support a Black-owned business. Put your money in a Black-owned bank. Invest in Black people. Um, That's huge for me. And so I want to be part of that legacy that creates that change and that shift. Um, Because again, if we're we're not going to be helped out from a system that should be helping us, then we got to do it ourselves. Um, I, I hope my legacy is much more than just, you know, dollar signs. I want to be able to give back to my community in, in numerous amount of ways. And so I hope that I'm remembered by that before I'm remembered by anything I ever did on the court. Well, you definitely will be remembered for much more than the game of basketball. And 
your leadership and what you're doing. And I just want to say I appreciate you for being you, making time, even when I know you probably didn't even have time. I see you on the national platforms and doing remarkable work. I just want to let you know that I support you. You need anything from this end, I got you. And I always want to leave. Yeah, and I always want to leave people with something. You know, a good name is better than any silver or gold. And that's Bible. And you definitely got a good name. So I appreciate you, Queen. I appreciate you, Ken. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me.